So about a year into this, I was laying down watching TV, hands by my head, and I was watching Waco burn. And they were talking about this compound, and that's all my mom wanted was a compound. They had mentioned the word Colts, and they had talked about David Koresh and about how his how much power he had over his people. And I remember jumping up, going, "Mom, Dad's right! Like this, you're in a cult." In this episode, I have my good friend Matt Carlson on. He shares his story of growing up in a cult, how he eventually escaped, and how he's maintained his faith in Christ through it all. He's a great example of what it means to be resilient, and I think this conversation sheds light on how good character has developed. I hope you enjoy the episode. Uh, yeah, I know it was in Ruidoso. And what age was it that, it, because I, I don't think it was always you had that background that was a cultish uh, type of when, when he says a, a cultish, not a cult, a cult, a nah, cult, no, yeah. not a cult, <laughs> worshiping cult. demons. Yeah, um, I would say it mostly st- it started like uh, officially in Texas. So we lived we lived in in Champion Forest, like a standard suburban town. Uh, Is that like southern of, western of Texas? Okay, Houston. yeah, oh, it's okay. a suburb of Houston. And uh, my aunt came, she moved to Montgomery, which is like, if I remember right, like 30 minutes, 30 minute drive away near Conroe. And so she moved, she moved there and that's kind of when it really started taking off. She, my aunt was like, she somehow. What was your living situation at the time? Like, who were you living with? What was the. Mom and dad. Um, My brother, I think my, my middle brother, Todd, he lived at the the house. He was probably 17, 18 at the time. How old were you? 19, uh, 12. Okay. 11, probably. 11, How 12. many siblings do you have? Uh, two. Okay, so, two brothers. Troy and Todd, yep. Yeah. yeah, they're like, Troy, they're like eight and nine years older than me. Something like that. Okay, so you're the youngest. Yeah. And so you're near, you're outside of Houston, Conroe area. I was in Houston. I mean, uh, Conroe is like, uh, it was more rural. Okay. Yeah. And so you're, you're, you're with your mom and dad and then your aunt, what's, how, how does that work? Uh, she lived in Iowa. I mean, I didn't really know her much growing up. I mean, she, she grew up in Cedar Rapids, stayed in the Cedar Rapids, and all of a sudden she decided to move to Montgomery, Texas. So that happened. To live with your parents? No, to, to she moved to Montgomery. And I, we were living we were living in Montgomery Conroe area. Okay. We were living, I was she just with moved my parents to around family. Area. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So she moves around family and then and then what happens? Uh they come over. So my my aunt and her husband, um, they had six kids. Um, three from her marriage and three that he had at home from his previous marriage. He had six kids total. And so her, her husband and her six kids moved to, moved to Montgomery. That was it. Pretty simple, normal story, like moved near some, you know, near family. And they would come over like frequently to the house. At the time I was, I was being, I went to a, a, a private Christian school, um, pretty typical family. Like my older brother's, uh, Troy moved out like the day he probably turned 18. Um, Todd was, Were things was, weird then? Uh, no, I, I, would, I would say like looking back at it, uh, a pretty typical. Um, my dad worked like nonstop. Um, maybe a workaholic. I don't know. He just hated traffic. He hated waiting. He hated inefficiency. And so he would... Kind of like you, right? Uh, uh, identical yeah. in a very strange <laughs> way. He, he So he would go to work really early before the rush and he would come home late to make sure he just missed like the rush hour traffic. And so he worked my mom, um, she didn't work. She would, uh, attend church. We, we, we attended a, from what I remember, like pretty normal churches. My brothers would say otherwise I was so young. I didn't really know the, know the difference. And, uh, my what aunt, would one of their gripes be like about the church? Uh, we would, I guess, jump from church to church was like, one was like really Pentecostal, like hands in the air, hooping and hollering, talking in the tongues to a, more traditional, like sit down, shut up kind of service. Okay. Um, I was a kid, dude. I attended youth group. That's all I remember. It's just, yeah. I, I had fun. Yeah. Okay. I had fun, love Jesus. And they were pretty, like pretty based, normal youth groups. They weren't all built around uh, uh, playing games. So, okay. It seemed normal to me. Okay. So when did things get weird? What, what, what happened? Uh, my, my aunt, my aunt, my aunt, uncle, all their kids would come frequently and then eventually we would then start going out to montgomery and visiting them how far is this from where you were 30 minutes okay yeah 30 minute drive it could be an hour for all i know it seemed like 30 minutes yeah. i was a kid and so uh we my, my mom decided we needed to move to montgomery 
t- like just down the street from where my aunt lived, build a log cabin. And that's where we needed to move to. My dad was like not really down with it because he drives from our house in, in Houston to downtown Houston. He worked uh, at Texaco, um, like in the, like the high rises. And so for him, it, that was unreasonable. Like he can't drive that far, you know, it adds an extra half What was her motivation motor. wanting to move into I the cabin? I honestly don't know. I'm a, I'm a kid. It? Yeah. I mean, I, I, mean I, I don't know what, what the reasonings were. I just so, heard all the fights. Okay. They just fought all the time. But she wanted to move to a log cabin, more remote. Does have anything to do with like the typical, like the end is near type I, of thing? I would assume so. Looking back at the time, I didn't really know. And honestly, like that, that community had two private ponds with unlimited fishing. And so I was fine with that. Like, it sounds great. I'm going from a place where, I mean, I, I just grew up as a kid. We'd go to the creek and catch turtles and we had, you know, lived in a large house, pool, hot tub, normal suburban upbringing to like an area where I can just go. I mean, our backyard was the national forest. It was awesome. awesome. Yeah. And so, so you guys did end up moving. We ended up moving. We bought a, we bought two plots of land. Um, one was a, like the house that we bought that was already there was like a, somebody's vacation or a vacation rental, you know, probably 900 square feet, two bedroom house. And the plot next to it is where we built like this massive log cabin. We had a company, like we designed it and a lot company came out and built this, you know, full round log. And how much property cabin. was it? Maybe an acre and a half, two okay. acres. Not, so it combined it was like a couple yeah. acres. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm not, I mean, enough for two houses and a three car garage. So it was a pretty big piece of land and a massive garden. And so we, we started building that. And during that, it, and how was your, where's your dad at within all this? My dad, he, uh, being wise, he, uh, stayed, he bought an apartment downtown Houston. Okay. And Monday through Friday, he was, he would work and go back to his, go back to his apartment. And then on, on Friday, he would then drive, make the drive out to Conroe, spend Texas. Spend the weekends spend with Spend the him. weekends with us. And then he would drive back to work. So he was gone five days a week. It wasn't much of a difference, honestly, because I really only saw him on Saturdays. That was like the day when we would just drive from computer store to computer store to computer store. We'd just go go check things out. This is before the internet. So it was like a giant computer shopper magazine, which is like an inch and a half thick. We would we would research like component parts on that. And then throughout the week, then on, on Saturday, we'd go like physically see like what was available. He just loved computers. That was his that work. Was, that was like his, no, he worked for Texaco, but like that was our, that was like the thing that we did together. Like, what do I know about my dad? He loved computers. Okay. So that was the thing that we did together every Saturday without fail. Huh. And so, um, so for me, I saw him on Saturdays and what changed, I still saw him on Saturdays. And so nothing really changed for me too much, but the arguing that, that, that was happening in when we lived in Houston just got more and more drastic as we moved to, uh, to Montgomery. Um, my, my, my dad was, was saying like how outlandish it was and how much power, how much power my mom, my aunt had over my mom and how weird it was that it was. And the aunt was your mom's sister. It must've been right. It was yeah, biological sister. They all, I mean, I think they had six, my, my mom and aunt, they had four, you know, other siblings, um, they all grew up in Cedar Rapids from what I know, pretty normal upbringing. Um, my uncle's pretty cool. They all seem like there's normal dudes. Um, but my mom and my aunt, however, are, are wired on a different, um, diagram. And so, uh, my aunt had complete control. She could convince my mom to do anything. Come to turn out uh, what come to find out. What had been happening is when my mom bought a bread maker, she'd buy two. When she bought a microwave, she'd buy two. When she bought anything, she'd buy two. And she would take one and give one to my aunt. And then she also then took my dad's um, savings and bought them a house and also bought them another plot of land and bought them a car and was taking all of the money that my dad had been saving and was buying things for my aunt. All of his work on the I knew none of this. I found this out years later. I mean, I found that out actually after I left the cult, what had been happening after I heard the story from my brothers. So I went yep, too far yeah, yeah. ahead, but that's right. It's uh, I didn't realize like where all attention was coming from, but it made a lot more sense as to why they so were your had aunt so many had so much arguments. influence over your mom that she was for whatever reason was her, what was her marriage situation? What, was, what work were they in? Your your aunt and her my husband? aunt did nothing. My uncle was a handyman. 
Okay. He could do anything. I, I, don't, I don't even know what hit, what his like trade was beforehand. Uh, I think an engineer in some, some fashion, but he could fix and do anything. Did you his, like him? Was he a respectable man? He was a very passive, quiet individual who was very smart. He could, and, and your aunt kind of domineered the relationship. Maybe my aunt was the opposite of all those things, but she's very good at figuring out how to rewire people. Mm. My dad was not able to be rewired. Yeah. He was a tough guy. He was awesome. So, so, so your, your aunt has convinced your mom to siphon out your dad's hard work and value over the years through his savings and to buy them a plot of land mm. for what purpose and all, not just land, but house and all these different things. It, I, I was a kid. You don't like, really it's, know. It's so hard for me to not tell the end of the story and then to rewind and figure out like the thread of what, of how to make it all make sense is hard. I didn't know. I so just, when did you guys move? When did it become a cult? Like when did when did it become to you like this is weird? Like um when I really knew was I was laying down watching TV. At uh, how old? Um tw maybe 12. Okay, so same 12, same 12, 12 and a half. So about a year into this, I was laying down watching TV, hands by my head, and I was watching Waco burn. So Waco oh, wow. Waco so we lived in Texas. Waco was in Texas. It was on local news, much wow. less like like nationwide news. And I was laying down and I, and I had my, my mom and dad were, were fighting about, about like the idea of a cult. My dad believed that she was in some sort of cult. Like aunt, my aunt had some sort of power over her. And like, this is, was unreal of what, of, of how my mom was acting and what she was demanding and what she was doing was like, she was like a puppet on a string. And I'm laying there and I see like the FBI like walking up the ladder, getting, I mean, I, I mean, I'm sure I'm, I'm thinking I can remember these things more vividly because you can watch the video today. Mm -hmm. I, know I was exactly. watching real yeah. time. Right. And they were talking about this compound and that's all my mom wanted. It was a compound for us all to live together and have like this place where we could stay safe. And, uh, they had mentioned the word cult and then they had talked about David Koresh and about how his, how much power he had over his people. And I remember jumping up going, mom, dad's right. Like this, you're in a cult. <laughs> this is a cult. This is crazy. But this is a cult that has no firearms. Like there's no, th there's nothing cool. You, you guys weren't all living together at this point? No, nope. we lived, we lived probably like the equivalent of a block away. Maybe okay. if not, probably, probably less than that, but you know, like 12 houses away. So what still, so what made, what were the things that made you feel like it was a cult? Just the influence that your aunt had over your mom? It, it was definitely, so it was more of a, so in terms of how cults work, like I've not researched it, but it's a, it's a matter of, of how do you insulate a person from society? How do you isolate them to just yourself? Then how do you indoctrinate them to your own way of thinking? And then <laughs> I don't even know another eight word news, um, detonate them to destroy their <laughs> life. <laughs> right. So it was like, it was just this, it was, just, it was just growing. Yeah. Um, my mom gave my dad a book called Kingdom of the Cults by, by a guy named, uh, I think it's Walter Martin. Oh, wow. She gives him this giant book. She bought it from a, at a Christian bookstore, bought it for him and handed it to him. I don't remember the point when she handed it to him, but I remember the point when my dad came back from a week at working and he ha holds a book in his hand. He goes, you bought me this book to prove you're not in a cult. This is the worst book you could have ever have bought me. And he showed her what cult she was in. And so like the type mm. of things we would do in this cult, we read some, some papers by a guy named Charles Bernardi. Still can't find him. I've Googled him. I have no, no Wikipedia. I, I, you should look I, it up I could you probably, can. you could probably look him up now. Yeah. Charles he, Bernardi. I, I know he lived in Chicago, Illinois. Cause we went and visited him one time. Um, and then we stopped following his teachings after that. So a guy named Charles Bernardi. Um, we would get, we would be delivered like a, a package of all of his papers. We put into a binder. We have to read them every morning. Why did you stop following his teachings after you met him? What's the Don't significance know, we of told. that? Re oh, so you just, it was like, didn't we go to his house. Hand, maybe? The, the adults went, walked into the house. We all sat in a camper. All the kids did. They walked in there. They were in there for, I don't know. In the camper. It seemed like an hour or two. But they, no, oh, in we, the house. We, were, we stayed in the camper. We, we all see. got in a camper. And uh, they walked into the into the guy's house, like I think un, I think unannounced, like they didn't. He had no idea they were going to show up. 
And then they came back out, and that was the end of it. We were done following Charles Bernardi. So he's a false teacher wow. or a liar or something. He was All probably right. like, what's going on, guys? I don't know. What are you showing? What are you doing? Is I, that, that's one of those unknown things. Like, I would love to know, like, what, what really took place, huh. who Charles Bernardi is. If he has kids, like, do they know who, like, what his teachings were or... Or were they just using his stuff and turning it into something it wasn't supposed to be? Probably I have that. no clue. I would guess. Um, but our morning regiment was, um, I, so when we lived in, in uh, Houston, I was being, I was at a, a private school. I couldn't be in the private school anymore. I must be homeschooled because the teacher's daughter liked me. And that's, that's immoral to like a boy at that young. Yeah, that Twelve years age. old. Yeah, and so I could not go to that school again. So that was the reason. Hmm. Um, and then my mom. So we moved to we moved to Conroe. Then I had to be homeschooled. That was like the only no option. No schools. Yeah. So so then I, I only got the teachings from my aunt, uncle, mom, and whatever school books we bought, like a like a used school book, um, like like co op swap kind of thing. And they were typical, like a Becca books, which is like a Christian curriculum, which is incredibly hard. I don't recommend it. I was um, raised on a Becca and it almost broke my spirit. Oh, it's it just is very so rigorous. Hard. It's rigorous. And out of the fifth grade, I was outperforming Albuquerque high schoolers. Yeah. Which made me super lazy once I got to high school because I, I literally had to do no work for like two years. Yeah, you crush it. I mean, I mean, in terms of a curriculum, like they crush it. Mm. Uh, but it's, it's, it's hard because like it's, to prove that you know long division, let's do 50 problems. Of it's the all thing. based on like, repetition. Yes. So uh, like if you can remember a pattern, awesome. But I had no abstract understanding of like why math worked or why English was formatted the way it was. I just knew it because I said it a okay. billion times. So you're for not three starting years. at ground zero? No. Why it matters? No, there's no like conceptual intellectual understanding of why something works. It's just, this is how it is. So do it over and over and over. That's you, frustrating. Which it has its benefit, but it's, it's, it's weird. It yeah, helped. you diagram sentences that were incredibly too long for such a young kid, and I, it's a great curriculum. I just, it, it's a good way to make your kids hate school. Mm. Um, but so it was all pretty normal on that on that front. Um, but it was a matter of every morning wake up, um, go to my aunt's house, have a scripture that the Lord gave you, and we're going to tell you how the day is going to look. So my aunt wouldn't be the one who interprets all the scriptures. Uh, not too big of a deal yet. Um, that was, so what would be an example of how the day looks that she would lay out? Um, yeah, I, I just think of like the beginning, it seemed fairly innocent. Um, there would be, uh, somebody would read a scripture and it would be about the enemies at the gates and you need to protect yourself or whatever it was. And then all of a sudden it'd be like, okay, today we all need to, we're going to build a rock wall around our entire compound. (laughs) Okay. Here we go. And I'm like, (laughs) Right. This is later in this is later in life. Sure. Right. So I'm like, it progressed to that. It progressed to that. Where I'm like, I'm not doing that. She's like, well, we, that's what we need to do. That's what the Lord's telling us. I'm like, no, that's what you told us to do. Yeah. That's where it gets weird. And so I'm like, how big of a wall do you want? Who are we trying to keep out? So you, where are we getting these rocks from? And this is after the Waco stuff, I imagine, when the rock wall it was, was like well, so, I mean, it's so in. It's so hard. Like it's, it's hard to even, even, even put the story into a, into a, uh, timeline. A timeline without it being really long, because mm-hmm. what 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 took place between like what we were talking about me, uh, you know, just waking up and pretty pretty simple like wake up, have some scriptures, and you just are controlled by it. Well, that's how we're supposed to live our lives. Yeah, we should wake up and we should have the Lord leading us. Yeah, it sounds fantastic. Uh, so my my so for example, here's a way my my aunt would twist scriptures. My mom decided she needed to divorce my dad. And, and, and he, she had the right to do so because he committed adul- adultery. And so that was one way that Moses gave, gave women a way out or, or spouses a way out. And so she pursued divorce. To make her look good, she went to a Christian counselor and she took me there. And then she, because then she, she was seen, I guess from my knowledge now, my, from my brother's telling me is that she went to like a really uh, cutthroat lawyer who told her all the steps to take to make sure that she got the best, the, the, she got the best attorney to get the best outcome, which she should. Um, 
but she, he committed adultery with a woman named Texaco. Oh, whoa, that's funny. Not funny, but that's funny. <laughs> because he was a workaholic, so his mistress was his work. Oh, okay, I thought you were less, like, what? That's, that I was how, the that's yeah. the story. Was that, Wait, was that, really? Was that? So that was your mom's excuse for divorce? Yes. Was that he, he worked too much? He worked too much, and so he He was, never cheated on her. He cheated on her with his mistress named Texaco because he loved working so much. Oh, that was you, the mistress. You, you pulled one on me, yeah. That that was it. I mean, I, mean, I, well, I know, but, but you I know, according know to the Bible, yeah. that's not that's not what well, the Bible is no, talking according about. According to anything rational, it's not a way. Uh, you to, got me there. Yeah, yeah. I thought your dad really had you know committed adultery. That'd be a weird. That'd be a weird name for a woman. <laughs> I don't know. I have I, Texaco. You, you say things like that sometimes, <laughs> and I'm like, whoa. Um. So wait, when did your relationship with your mom turn sour? Uh, I I I didn't really have a relationship with my dad or my mom. I mean, I would hang out with my dad and we would go, we would look at, we go to computer stores, you know, mm -hmm. computer, et cetera, or software, et cetera, Babbage's electronics boutique. You still know I mean, them all. Oh, dude. I mean, it was the thing I did. Like between my dad and I, like that's how I knew him. Um, with my mom, I'm, I'm thinking back. My brothers asked me this recently. Like um, they said, do you, do you remember a time when mom did something with you? Like anything, like took you to like a zoo or. I was like, I can't think of any memories like that. He goes, that's because she didn't. She never came to our football games. She never came to, um, my brother was like a, a, an expert uh, uh, trumpetist. Never came to any of our recitals. Never came to any of my play, any, any of our, um, what do you call them? Sure. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, why, well, why not, would you say? I asked him. I was like, so what was she doing? He goes, I have no idea. She didn't work. She just wasn't interested. Huh. Like, what was she, she stayed home? What was she interested in? Interesting. He goes, I don't know. She really loved church. Hmm. So she's always been wrapped up in that culture of like, I just do this, but I do nothing else. I was a kid, man. Like I I didn't, I mean, all, all I knew was like I played double dragon. We rode skateboards. We lit things on fire. Like, I just had fun as a kid. But I couldn't think of a single time when I did something with my mom. It wasn't a thing we did. I mean, besides like grocery shopping. So your brother would kind of told you this at what point? Uh, like two months ago. Oh gosh, we we still reminisce trying to yeah. figure, trying to put the put pieces together because mm -hmm. we were separated from ten for ten years. Like because that isolation thing, I didn't mean it by isolation by keep you away from school, keep you away from everybody in life. Oh, because like, your brother moves out and you cannot have contact, cannot or just didn't cannot. So when we moved to Mont Montgomery, it was a we don't we don't talk to anybody. We don't we don't mess it. You don't message your grandma and grandpa. And it was a systematic thing that was intentional. They implemented yeah, that. It's yeah, like, I mean, it came to a point where I couldn't mention their names. When something bad would happen, it would be, it, so my brothers are Troy and Todd, their initials were used. Somehow the spirits would hear us. That was, that was like the claim. Like, don't say their name because the spirits will know. I'm like, what spirits? And the answer was, you want me to name what spirits? I'm like, yeah. Ready? Cut them off. Cut them off. Come on. And they, it was, it was very contentious. Weird. And so they were called TNT. And so TNT, what is that? What is that? We all know what it is. It's explosions. It's destruction. Oh, weird. That's what they are. And so they would, they would, they would create yep. this, this like mystery world that only they knew the answers to. So it was like Gnosticism. Like only we have special knowledge. We'll let you know what the special knowledge yep. is if, if we must tell you. But ultimately, we're the ones who know. And so shut up. So wait, 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 wait. So, so, so. It gets weird, but what, where, so you said this guy's passive, right? Your aunt's husband, your uncle, <laughs> um, he just allowed all this to happen and had no say, no input, no. What, so his name is Pat. What I knew about him was he was really good at things. If I had a question for him, it was, it, he had answers for everything that had nothing to do with my aunt's stuff. He would just avoid those questions like the plague. But he would answer questions of, a, of how to repair, how to fix, how to build, how to, he was really good with his hands. But in terms of, of him interfering with my aunt's uh, delusions and control, zero. He would do whatever she said. I found out this like uh, maybe five years ago that he was married, had six kids, and he was in a small group. 
my aunt was in that same small group. My aunt, uh, so his wife was was ill with something, like pretty pretty sick. It was on it was on prescription prescription medication for her her sickness, and she, my aunt, told told Pat that if he really trusted God, then he would stop giving her medication. Like that's that's true trust in God. Like how, how would he bless you if you didn't trust him? And so he stopped giving his wife medication. And then um, that's dark stuff. She died. Hmm. He lost. And then his, she married He lost him. his mind. Sent his all of his six kids to go live with family, and then he joined a monastery. Hmm. So he was a Christian. Uh, you know, from what I know, yeah, I didn't. Know. This is all. In, this is all happened in Cedar Rapids. This all happened before they moved to to Texas. And then eventually, at some point, I'm not sure if it was a long length, uh, a, a long length of time, or if it was pretty quickly. But he came, he came to, came back to get his kids, and ended up marrying my aunt. And was a very so the, all six of his kids. She assumed. Of, so three of them were were old enough to not be at the home. So she, they were they were they were old and out of the house. So he had three kids, and she had three kids. Oh, okay. And so she had three kids, and she what divorced. Was the, Okay. Yeah. She divorced her her husband because she said that he was a he was a warlock, and his mom was the high priestess witch of of Iowa, and that she w- wait what my my aunt claimed that her husband was a warlock, and that his mother was the high priestess witch of of Iowa or Cedar Rapids. Any truth said. to this? Um, that's what I was told for a decade. Okay. Was this kind of stuff, and that my that my three cousins, her her children, were abused all the time, and they were they grew up in in chicken coops, and were and would live underneath the floorboards of a house, and they were hung on fence posts in the middle of the night for some demons or something. I was told all this for years. Yeah, and I mean, I'm like at this point, you know, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, hearing this stuff, I'm like, what in the world are you talking about? I didn't know about the satanic panic. I didn't understand that this was like a thing that was being being espoused by typically by wives against their husbands. And so I thought nothing of it besides you say this a lot, but my cousins never mention it. They never say anything about this happening to them. She changed she legally changed their names. And then when when she remarried, he adopted them under different names. So if you were to look for these kids, you'd never find them because they all have different names. So I, I eventually I was asking my cousins, the ones that were willing to talk. I'm like, did this, do you remember this stuff happening? I keep being told this happened to you, but did this really happen? None of them could remember a single time when any of those things that they were told happened to them, happened to them. So then it made me very suspicious. Like you lie about everything. I mean, she lied about everything. Things you would see in front of you that you watched happen, she would tell you that's not happening. The gas lights. All, t- all the time. Yeah. I have a very hard time with gaslighting. It makes me... Triggered. Sh- that's how you put it, yeah. <laughs> Violent. I am, it makes me angry. I mean, to the point where we'd be driving down a road, and be, my aunt and uncle in the front seat, my mom somewhere in the middle bench seat of, an, of a suburban. We'd be packed in, all of us would be packed into one suburban driving down a road and then a suburban that wasn't even the same color it just needed to be like a i don't even know what the what the what the make and model needed to be but it needed to be something similar and she would point at it and go look that's pat sherry and the kids every and she turned around and go everyone say it say that's pat sherry and the kids say it and they'd all like start saying look that's pat sherry and the kids and i'm looking at them going what in the world is happening you're in front of me Making all of your kids say that's Pat sharing the kids, and so what was it? It was just like some stranger, just some, some car, just some vehicle driving. So she's driving. The she's opposite like direction. hallucinating or like on some sort of trip, and she's I would making like to everyone think else. That was the case. It's hard because like I can, I can tell you what actually was happening. What 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 was actually happening is that she. Well, so to end that story. In that instance, we're driving through like the desert somewhere like near Deming or something, something that was pretty desolate. We're driving. She saw a license plate that was an Iowa license plate. And she thought that her ex-husband was coming to get her kids because she took them. That's actually what happened. I didn't know this until 12 years later. That's right. I remember you telling me. And so she would say this whole thing. 
because what that would do then was is we would then drive the we would drive a the long way home. We'd pack all of our bags and be told um, it would be wise for you to like get some things ready in case somebody were going to be driving a long distance. So she took the three kids, uh-huh. renamed them uh-huh. illegally. I don't know. Actually, I don't know the details. But I probably don't without the the husband's consent, right? The father's consent. And so she's driven into this constant paranoia that she's being chased, and that she's got this guilt laying down on her constantly. And so she's trying to like create a, a um, that false reality for you guys, trying to uphold this lie that she's. All I can think is that she took her kids and she needs to figure, and she, she is living in paranoia, probably schizophrenic. And she thinks that, that her husband's close because they're always talking about his name was, uh, I shouldn't say it. His initials were GB. We always called him GB, the spirit of GBs around. I'm like, what does that mean? You don't want to know. I'm like, I do want to know. Go ahead and tell me, tell me. So you never had a good relationship with her. Do you always kind of like treat her with disrespect and, you know, sarcasm? That I always treat her dis- disrespectfully, yes. Yeah. I hated her. How, I'm curious, how did her kids feel about her? They were terrified of her. The, uh, two of them, one of them, uh, I mean, one of them ran away in the middle of the night and joined the Air Force. One of them- Got out. Um, most everybody ran away. That was usually how they escaped. They would escape literally in the middle of the night. He happened to- um, Take the keys, leave a leave a note where the vehicles would be left, and he joined the Air Force in the middle of the night. And so that happened, but that was like when he was eighteen. We were supposed to go together. We were, or we had a whole plan. It's a very long story. Like that's where it's like hard to even know where yeah. to, where to begin. You had an end. escape plan. So I was supposed to escape with him the day I turned eighteen. So he would have been like nineteen twenty. We were going to both join the Air Force. We we're going to go to Alamogordo, join the Air Force, um, go through hopefully a school and get a degree in computer science. After our four years was up, we were going to use the money. We we're going to save all our money, use the money to, to buy a computer store. And we both love computers. And that was like, our going to be our escape plan. We didn't know how life worked. Like if we go, to, if you join the military, they'll teach us how life works. So we didn't have money. We didn't have a skills that we were aware mm, of. We didn't have, all we did was work. Like that was, I mean, it was a cult that just worked and was controlled by my aunt. And so, uh, he ended up, so I was, I was 16, probably close to going on 17. He, he ran away in the middle of the night. I get a call. So he left you. He did. Dead. <laughs> he, 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 uh, I got a call over the intercom. We had like this intercom that runs over, over power lines. So it's like, a the technology is like, like ethernet over power. But anyways, we had one power line running across the entire, entire property. So we had a, a intercom in our camper. They had an intercom in their camper and we get the call of like, you need to get up here right now. So who, who, who calls? My aunt. So your aunt's freaking my aunt, out. My aunt doesn't do anything. So she would have one of her kids call down to have us go up there. So she's so, like, oh no, so-and-so's gone. Um, I didn't fully know. I was like, what's going on? Or my aunt, mom asked maybe. And um, Brian ran away last night. He left a note here saying that Matt had a plan to go with him. Oh, so he left you like for I was dead. Like, my gosh, dude. Like, why would <laughs> did you, he did? He left did, me for did, dead. Did he ask you to go with him? Uh, so we had we had planned for years to go together when I turned 18. But but he jumped the gun or did you? So was there an opportunity I, I for you? I was a go little I was a little afraid of like what? Like I have another year and a half until I turn 18. Will we have the ability to do this? Like, I don't know. Oh, okay. Don't, so maybe maybe he gave you the opportunity he, to go and he was like, I got to go. I'm going now. Uh, and, and I I was I, I mean I can t- tell you like I was pretty skittish like I don't think his plan is going to work out we're okay. going to be screwed at some point we're going to end up back here like, I don't know what's going to happen but so it's not he probably didn't well. have a high confidence in you I don't think at he did. the moment yeah. I, I, I wouldn't have yeah I would have been like I'm done dude I mean he was 18 so turning he 19 and he dipped in the middle of the night he took he took their um it was a Jeep Cherokee 60s model like gorgeous car he took that vehicle and the one possession that he owned that he got to keep. Like, cause everything that we got from our previous life before the cult was all like gotten rid of all ties to the, to the past. But he had one item and that was a pair of binoculars. He went to a pawn shop, sold those for, I think 10 bucks, bought a bus ticket, went to Almogordo and joined the air force. 
What he didn't realize is that you don't just join the Air Force. This isn't like watching a John Wayne movie. You sign up. And where do they send you? Home. <laughs> Wait, what? So he, so he comes back home, like maybe the next day. I don't think it was the same day. I think it was the next day. Turned out that, the, that he, he, he enlisted or whatever you call it. I guess it was enlisted. And the, um, the, I don't know, the Air Force dude, whatever, drives him from Alamogordo all the way home. No, they got him a bus ticket and he, and he came back home. They were trying to see if they had enough like vouchers to, for him, to have him stay in a hotel for two weeks. Cause he had to wait uh, two, three, two weeks, three weeks, um, until they had a, a the, like the, a, a slot when they had all the, you know, when they were bringing people into the Air Force, whatever that's called. Yeah. And so he had to come back home. Oh so he God. arrives and I was like, oh my gosh, you're he dead, is dude. so screwed. Yeah. And so for the next two weeks, could have been a month, he was just screamed at nonstop. He was screamed at, he was pleaded with. We would all sit in a circle and pray for like six to eight hours at a time that his, that his, his mind would change and that the Air Force would change their mind or whatever they thought was going to happen, but that somehow God would intervene and the plans would change and he wouldn't join the Air Force. So how much was up to him still? I mean, I imagine he was like, no, I'm going. I'm oh, going. He was, oh, he was like, I'm, dude, I'm out. They, they, would, they would let him have it. And the, the slivers of time when I was able to talk to him, he's like, I'm going, dude. Yeah. Like nothing's stopping me. I'll just, I'll, I, have, I have to be somewhere. I can't afford to live in a hotel. And so this is it. So he just, he just toughed it out. And then that's what it was. The day, so he came to he, uh, his enlisting agent or whatever it's called, officer, came and picked him up and then wanted to meet the family that he told um, him about. And he did. And he also wanted to know how he got such high ASVAB scores. I guess it was like the highest he's ever seen. I guess ASVAB is like a SAT. We were all at Becca, dude. Like we, we yeah. had a great education. Rigorous education, so yeah. He got incredible scores. We were all homeschooled. And that was it. We didn't see him for like six months. I think it's about how long it was. And we, we went to his um, graduation in San Antonio. We all got in a, in a vehicle. We all got in an RV. That's how we traveled. An RV in a, in a, my mom had a, a town and country minivan with like the w fake wood sides, a little pop-up yeah. camper. Yeah. We drive out to San Antonio. My aunt still had like his aspirations of, I'm going to talk him out of, out of leaving. And so he, you know, they all, they're running by they're, They just finished a uh, basic. So a school hasn't happened yet. They're running around. And they're like, I don't know, saluting or something. But I remember we were all looking at him, trying to figure out who, which one was he? His name is Brian. And we were all guessing as to which, which guy we thought he was. We all got it wrong because we had no idea what he looked like. When he lost 50 pounds, his head was shaved. He had super thick like Coke bottle glasses. And then we sat in this room where they got like their, their I don't know, like, I don't know if it was a, they got like a enlisted. I guess when you finish, finish basically give you something, stand and take a picture with like the, the, drill sergeant and uh but before that happens they come and sit down next to you next to you they're like go sit next to your family and, and come up when your name's called and all of a sudden he sits next to me i look at him i was like oh Whoa. none of us knew who you were and uh the next day they got a free day so he takes his picture right he, he he's enlisted now and uh we got a, he got a free day where we could go anywhere and my aunt, long story, but anyways, she chose to go to Fiesta, Texas. And so we took him to Fiesta, Texas to try to entice him that this life is not as bad as it seems. And, and of course, my cousins and I are like, dude, nothing's changed. It's got, gotten worse. So you do not want to move back. He's like, nothing's moving back, dude. And so he, he, the next day, he went back and did A school and he was out. Dang. He made it. Yeah. Wow. And so give me, so two things. What was the worst moment would you say with the most extreme cultish type behaviors that you think happened during that era and then two how did you get out i don't know if there's a a, a, a worse um like what was one, one of the most extreme bizarre things that you were required to do asked to do things that you witnessed you know, that type of thing. Um, I'm glad to say, I guess now, but um, uh, there, there was nothing like 
physical. It was all like, basically it was just emotional and like spiritual abuse. Authoritative. Authoritative, like yeah. misplaced authority. So we had, we, we had a, a fake, a false basement underneath my aunt's house, which was full of food because we were supposed to be the 144,000 that were going to make it. We're going to be the ones who lived when everyone else died. And we built a campground. From so the 144,000 is from Revelation. It is, yeah. I, I I don't know how they try to figure out how, to how did they that interpret it. Yeah, I don't know, but they were the, they were. We had a, a a RV park that was going to be for the chosen ones, hmm. called Joseph Land. And we built. No, oh, that's know, we, what, we was prob- that literally what it was called, or was, it was they called, called Joseph it? Land? Wow, my aunt was in the tribe of Joseph. My mom, literally, like lineage. No, dude, like they're <laughs> Czechoslovakian, like they full blown like Russians do. Like, no, they were not That's funny. zero Jew. I, I, I got a <laughs> DNA test. Um, so no, uh, I don't know how they try to put it all together. Like they, they weren't really into telling us like how they did things. They were more into telling us what to do with the things that they, they want us to do. So we built a, a campground. She was from the tribe of Joseph. It's all spiritual. My my mom was from the tribe of Metaphor, Reuben huh? because she, he was the one who was the most um, kind to Joseph, who didn't want to kill him when they threw him in the pit. Like let's let's let him live. So it's literally like your your mom and her sister, with all due respect, were um, playing like some fantasy house thing, and they were granted authority they shouldn't have been granted, and they abused that authority and created a fantasy land in the middle of nowhere where they had no accountability, where nobody would speak up, passive husband, your dad's out of the picture now. Um, and they're just in the middle of nowhere. And now you got your, your kid, the kids are just like, okay, whatever you say, they've been granted authority and are being crazy. Yeah. They're crazy. We're used, right? So we were just tools. Yeah. My aunt, she did two things. Besides sleeping and waking up, she smoked cigarettes and drank coffee. That was that was literally the all only uppers, thing. just like all tweaking all the time. She's basically like a uh, she's like um like uh, uh what did she say? She would use the verse about like there's uh, those who those who pray they should be the ones who are still given honor and they are the ones who you tithe to tribe of Levi or something. Mm. And so she just prayed. That's what she said she did. I'm not sure who she prayed to. Um, but she would pray and she would tell us what to do. So she would sit there. We even built her a perch. Like we had a, a we built, we built two log cabins in, in Rudoso. Whoa. So it was my, my uncle and seven of us kids. We built two pretty large um, cabins. Um, I mean, there was, we, we had to cut, uh, we couldn't, first of all, we couldn't use small sledgehammers and drive the stakes in. Cause every, every four feet, I believe you had to put a long, like a 14, 14 inch stake uh, hmm. like a spike um, into each log, but none of us had the strength to do it. We couldn't hold a sledgehammer that was big enough to drive them in. And a small sledgehammer wasn't heavy enough to put them in. It was like, <laughs> and we didn't have enough money to buy screws. That was like the dilemma. Like, how do we build this with a bunch of children? And so the solution, <laughs> the solution was we got full size sledgehammers. We cut the handles in half. Because then we could we could actually pick up the the heavy sledgehammer if the if it was if the handle was shorter because you could because then you could swing it in front of you mm. and then we would pre drill one log so that way at least you had you had half the spike in through the first log but then you don't have to drive it the next seven inches to get through the second log and then into the third by a, by a smidge and so at the beginning like we were just going at it my uncle would cut the boards uh, cut the logs and we would we would put the sycaflex on and we would stack them. It was like, it was like Lincoln logs, like Legos is pretty easy. And then you'd, you'd drive the spikes in at the end of it, dude, like we could take a full size sledgehammer and drive those things in like three swings. We would have contests to see who could, who could put them in the fastest. Dang. So we got strong. We learned a lot of skills. Um, but my aunt, what'd she do? She sat, she smoked, she drank. And you guys built perches for her to pray. Yeah. To her God. Well, yeah. In the, in the clear story, we built like a spiral staircase and she would sit up there and she would watch the campground. How many square feet she were these see, cabins? Um, I want to say hers or theirs, I guess, uh, was 25 by 50 or so. Oh. And then... Just one like large... One long rectangle. Okay. And then ours was, was, I think, the same same like depth. So 25 feet, maybe 30 feet by, let's say, 40 40 or 50. Maybe hers was like 60 to 75. I don't know. But it was hers was longer. An extra full 
two bedroom sizes. Um, so was, we just worked. She did that. Interesting. So she, she, yeah, he just built everything for her. He just did what she wanted. Hmm? Cause he lost his, you think it's just cause he lost his mind from his I, first marriage. I would marriage. assume so. I mean, what's funny is my, my brothers, after we, after I left the cult there, they were like, so Pat was the one who led the whole thing, right? Like he was secretly very quietly. So like, I always, always had a really weird feeling about him cause he was just so quiet. He could fix anything. Help my brother like fix a, an old firebird and stuff. And I was like, no, he led nothing. It was all Sherry. Like, you're kidding me. Like, no dude, she just controlled it all. Like a puppet, like a puppeteer, like a master puppeteer. So, so it's over now, right? Yeah. Yeah. The last cousin ran away. They moved to Juarez. My mom. Wait, my your aunt? aunt? My Mo mom, aunt, and um, the youngest uh, daughter moved to Juarez. And she ran away in the middle of the night in Juarez. Got a hold of her, her male brother, uh, uh, so brother, brother, I guess step stepbrother, and he went drove down to Wadas to go find her and pick her up. I don't know if she made it to El Paso or not, or how exactly that worked out. But he's like, "This is not. You don't run away in Wadas, dude. Like a white girl in Wadas no. at midnight. Like careful, it's a yeah, terrible idea." And so she moved up to up to Albuquerque. I talked to her once. I haven't seen her since. But so they have nobody under their authority anymore. No, no. As a matter of fact, my my aunt, I got a call from my the oldest um, son. It's the one who joined the Air Force, became a meteorologist. He's worked for different organizations. Now he lives in, in uh, Seattle, I believe. Uh, he called me and he was like, hey, man, I just want to give you a heads up. Um, Sherry's at a mental hospital. This is your aunt? Yeah. I was like, <clears throat> of course, okay, and why are you telling me this? He's like, I just want to let you know she was picked up in Rodoso. She was running around the city naked with her underwear on her head and, and fighting the cops. Fighting like, cops? Fighting cops. I was like, or fighting the cops. I'm not sure if she was fighting. I think eventually turned into fighting cops. I don't know how it all started. <laughs> um, I was like, okay, what do you want me to do about it? And he's like, nothing. Just wanted to let you know in case somebody called. I was like, okay, dude, thanks. So this I, was how long ago? This was this recent, This was probably right? six, hmm, four or five years ago. Oh, wow. And so I... I think at some point he may have told me the organization that had, that had, that had her. And so I called them and, uh, and I said, Hey, I'd like to talk to the person who's, who's caring for, uh, Sherry. And she's like, well, she's out right now. If you wouldn't mind, I can get your name and number and I'll give, have her give you a call back when she's, when she comes back. It's like, I would love to do that. So she calls me back like 15 minutes later and she's like, Hey, it's my understanding that, you know, you know, Sherry. I was like, I sure do. Is there anything that I, I need to know what like, that would be good for me to be aware of. I'm like, yes, keep her for as long as you possibly can indefinitely if possible, but she's needed this her whole life. Something's terribly wrong with her. What do you think it was? My brothers think that when she was 16, she got in a rollover accident and she got a metal plate in her head. Schizophrenia. And since then she's never been the same. And I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, I, I don't know. I don't know. That's it. Um, could be. You know, it's interesting that she brought up, um, she blamed her husband, right? Um, for like witchcraft or wizardry or all that stuff. Um, she s seemed to have some maybe level of interest in, in that whole world. Right. Which would, would, would be, you know, weird spiritual stuff. It right. seemed to be impl implemented into the Christian. So I ethos. listened to a podcast about about the Satanic Panic, and there was a, a time frame in the eighties when the eighties mid nineties when wives that wanted to get out of their out of their um, marriage would would convince and tell the public that their husband was a was a, a uh, whatever warlock. Huh. So and, that literally and the was church a thing. would then attack the husband huh. and would then then give custody to the to the to the wife so she could leave the is marriage. That, is it, what, what is the actual backing of warlock husbands? Like is there any any like verifiable Oh no, the kids substances? They, they found them later. So so they after they had become adults and they left the cult, they went and found him. The still, kids. he still lives in Iowa. He's just a normal dude. So but, she was lying. Huh? She was just crazy. Yeah. And his mom? I don't do it. No idea.
Yeah. I, I would assume the same. Like yeah. Everything else in life. I Gosh, mean, so she just lost it. She went off. She stole the kids. She um, persuaded your mother. Was she older than your mom? Younger. Oh, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. Younger. Weird. Sherry is younger than my mom. But she yeah. had more influence. She had I mean, influence my, my mom. wife met, met my aunt twice. First time was very, was very brief. Like I, I had told her stories and uh, we went to the property in Rodoso, walked up some stairs and they had a dog inside that just hated Tish, like, like was barking and like jumping on her to the point where she had like bruises up and down her legs. So it was a very brief like introduction yeah. to my family. Um, the second time that, that, and she met her, she very much met my mom and aunt um, I went to a carving contest because I what I did for a living was I I learned chainsaw art, and so I you picked a, that up from chainsaw. Nicole. Uh, I was 16 years old and 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 was bored, and so th that was a thing in Rodoso was people making art with chainsaws, making bears, and, and stuff so like we that. had already used chainsaws to clear seven acres of property. We had already used uh, we basically was like whatever you're not you're not supposed to do with a chainsaw, that's what you do to make art. It was fast, right? So it was very efficient to make to make things. And uh, I was at a carving contest. It was a Smoky Bear carving con competition um, in Capitan, New Mexico. And it's it's like a market, right? Like, so you'd have a competition that would be happening in like a, a protected area, so people wouldn't get hurt by flying pieces of wood. But then you'd have all your art, you know, art with like you know the back of your truck with a table, and you'd have all your stuff to to sell. And you'd also do a demonstration. Yeah, so the carving mm. competition was our demonstration, and then all of our art was for sale if you wanted to oh, buy stuff cool. from the from the artists. And uh, so my my so Tish, I just recently got gotten married. We may have been dating actually at the time. She was manning the booth where I had all my stuff for sale, and then directly across the lot was my mom, my aunt, and my cousin, the youngest girl. Yeah, so she was the only one left at the time. And uh, I'm like, good luck. I, I mean, I'm gonna have head, I'm gonna have earmuffs on, and I'm gonna be carving. So, like, good luck. And this is just by coincidence because it's coincidence. The I had no idea she was gonna show up. Wow, no clue. And so, at the end of the competition, I'm um, getting all my gear, you know, you know, uh, sorted and brought back to the truck. My wife was was currently talking to my mom and my aunt, and I walk over there like, oh my gosh, this is uh -oh. gotta, this has got to be wild. And my mom was right in front of Tish. T Tish was talking to her and she would ask my mom a question. My aunt was sitting on the back of like there, I think it was a Ford Explorer. She was like sitting either in the, I think the, the tailgate or the back of the Ford Explorer. And she would, she would tell my mom what to say. Then my mom would repeat her. This is what I walked into. Weird. And it looked normal to me. That's just kind of how. It's like your mom is a surrogate. Yeah, it was, like, it was it was like, it was kind of normal. It was just life was insane, and so then my wife goes, "Why are you telling her what to say?" My mom goes, "She's not," and she and then then Tish would I mean then Sherry would tell my mom what to how to, how to answer that question. She's like, "She's telling you right now what to say." She's like, "No, she's not. She didn't tell me anything." And then my aunt would tell my mom how to respond. And then she's like, she, she's, she's telling you right now. It. She's like, no, she's not. How I'm weird. like, welcome to my family. It's just insane. How did and that, so, how did that um, end that whole little um, conversation? She, my mom told my, told Tish that she's not saved, that she needed three salvations. That Tish was not saved. Yes. Oh. So she told her she, she needed three but salvations. She, she was Christian, but not, but, but not, not mom. the right one, not the right kind. Mm-hmm. And so she needed three salvations, body, mind, and spirit. She's gone through the body and the mind, but not the spirit. Like it was like, it was all Gnostic beliefs. Like they, they're the only ones who had true knowledge of how things worked. So if you were to describe the denomination or the uh, doctrinal category. There wouldn't be one. You wouldn't, you wouldn't have. I, don't, I, I mean, I mean, if I studied them, I could probably find something that's similar. Um, I know when I had talked to Paul Skazafava, cause I, I went to school of ministry and, uh, probably a year or two after that incident. Um, and I had talked to Paul Skazafava. He was the one who taught, he was a pastor in uh, Calvary Santa Fe. And I explained to him um, the situation. He's like, uh, I don't know if I can really talk to your mom. I'm like, I can't. It doesn't end well. I get really, I, I sin in my anger. 
doesn't, it's never good. Um, but if you, like if I, if I could get you an opportunity to talk to her, maybe you could help her snap out of it. It's like unlikely. Um, but explain to me a bit about like how they function. I told him maybe two sentences or three sentences. And then he, he filled in the rest. He was, this is how they work. I was like, Oh my gosh, how do you know? He's like, cause they're not creative. They, they follow like a set, uh, one of 10 different structures of how they function. And this is mm. number whatever. And he told me how they worked. I'm like, Oh, so she's crap. They're that kind of, kind of, it was kind of disturbing. I was like, this sucks, dude. Mm. How do you know all this? I wish I knew all this beforehand. Yeah. So you named a guy a while back. I'm curious. Were you able to find anything on this guy? I tried to uh, check in the internet and nothing came up. I checked like cult leader or what's his spiritual name? leader, Charles Bernardi. Yeah. Nothing came up. Interesting. The so other, he was probably the small other, time. The other um, person's books that we, we started to read after Charles Bernardi was gone was a girl named Jane Lead. Jane Lead. They were all books that were like uh, personally published. It was like uh, eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper printed right Says left. She's an English mystic and uh, proponent of universalist Christianity. Interesting. That's, that's different than what your mom might have been saying to Tish, which is funny. Oh, it, 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 we would pick and choose i know i was forced to read it and so i would i'm, I'm not going to read it not going to read it eventually i was yelled at often enough where i would just have a game boy old school one right with the green yeah. and black screen yeah and the i would just sit one. there with a the, mom like my mom somehow either didn't know or didn't care but i would just play game, game. Boy with the book in front of me she had a book <laughs> heck yeah called like i think we all have memories eight, of that the eight heavens and if we didn't follow my aunt's instruction and we only get to heaven number two but if we I Weird. mean, they had all these, cra- it was, it was new every day, dude. Like it was always spirits, spirit of my, my brothers would be around. My dad would be around. And what does that represent? It's like negative things. They're familiar spirits. So like the way they would, the way they think, the way they talk, the way they, they would be over you. But I, when they I would employ that, when they would, oh, okay. So I the spirit of TNT by, is around. Influenced by them. So their spirit would be here influencing my oh, So actions. they would use it as like a discouraging, like don't, your behavior Yes. I could sense their influence in you. You need to stop that. As a matter of fact, so weird. My so it was a spirit of DC. My dad's name was Doug Carlson, and so it was a spirit of DC. You can't use a full name because if you use a full name, then then all of the spirits and demons would come. You're summoning spirits. See, this is what I'm talking about with the witchcraft, the wizardry stuff. Like it's crazy stuff, yeah. right? And so they had told me that I was under the spirit of DC for a couple of days. I mean, it came to a point where my my name couldn't be mentioned. I couldn't be looked at. I could my I, my name I. My initials could be, but I mean, they didn't. I, I had to legally change my name. My my given name when I was born was William Walter Carlson, and I had to legally change it. Another story, but um, my dad's spirit, his his familiar spirit was was influencing me. And then my mom came home one day. I don't know if she got a so call what? or. I, you know, it was all bad. It's all bad just bad stuff. Oh, that's so, and so funny. what does that mean? If there's spirits around, you need to go inside and do nothing. That meant. So it was a little, times a punishment of all of the, um, spiritual influence, the essence of the, uh, whatever it is of, of people and things that she did not subjectively like. Right. <laughs> that's I mean, bad. Cause you yeah. have that on the flip side of that. You also have the physical side where every belonging that we had from our previous life, the life outside, like before the cult, had to be get gotten rid of. Beds, furniture, clothing, everything. So all ties from your previous life was completely removed. So that could, sounds you, very occultish. Yeah, I, 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 that'd be cool if it was, but I mean, I don't know if it was. <laughs> cool. <laughs> I don't know, dude. Like, I can't make sense of it. I imagine um, she probably had some weird influences like that were divided from Christian influence to some weird, you know, summoning spirits. There's things like that. It would, it would probably, I like to investigate everything in life. This is the one thing I've never even taken 10 minutes to. I've not cared. Like mm. I'm so, there was a, such a long time where I was so angry that when I thought about it or my mom would call me, I would turn into a, I would become when angry. Was the last time, be, when was the last time you talked to your mom? Uh, t- actually talk to her. I was standing in Target, the one on Paseo. This was probably 10 years ago. My mom called me hysterical. We were walking through a clothing section, 
remember stopping and I started yelling on the phone and Tish walks over to me and goes like, what are you doing? Why are you yelling? Why are you, you're treating her so disrespectfully. And I remember like, I just, at some point I needed to like let my mom go. And I was like, I can't do this. I, I am incapable of talking to her. I was so angry. I could not let go how much anger I had. And that was the last time I've actually talked to her on the phone. I've messaged her since via email and it's a lot easier to, to formally think through your, your thoughts. And then it became a, I was trying to win her over. Like, how can I help you see that? Like Jane lead is a mystic prophetess. Is she still subjected to her to uh, not, not Jane, uh, but to your aunt? No, my aunt went to a mental institution and from what I, what I, what I think happened because this, this property that we built was supposed to all go to us kids. It would never be sold. It was in Jesus's name under a trust under Jesus. That's what we're told. So it would never be sold. So if anything goes wrong in life, we always have a place to go back to. Um, she ended up putting that property for sale. She was going to sell it to my, one of my cousins for three quarters of a million dollars. He's like, I don't have 750 grand to, to buy property. And she ended up selling it to, to a realtor in town or no, to an investor in town. And I, I believe she used that money to then pay for the medical bills to help my aunt like recover or get help. Your mom. Yeah. So, but I've talked to her here and there via just text. My, my, one of my brothers has tried talking to her and he, she even called him, left this long voicemail and he called her back later about the voicemail. And she goes, I never told you that. And he's like, Mom, you left a voicemail on my phone and you said whatever it was, he could tell you. And uh, because he called me afterwards, he's like, dude, I just got the phone with my mom. And she she told me something via voicemail and she completely denied she said that. What's going on? I'm like, dude, I told you, like, she's insane. What what do you mean what's up with that? That's how she functions. And uh eventually she she came, she admitted what she was saying was like, yes, I'm sorry for bringing that up. I should never have told you those things. This is what's happening. I think it was, I think it was when my aunt was, was in the, was in the hospital. Mm. And so, but I don't know. So when you lost it on your mom and target, your frustration, would, would you say it's rooted in, what would you say was rooted in? And uh, is that redeemable? I'm good now. Yeah. I mean, it's, I always say that like I, I can vividly tell you that the time when I thought I was, I had recovered and it was over being angry. I was driving to church and on the radio, um, out of the blue, this, I kind of, these, these things all fell into, fell into play. Uh, Skip Heitzig was on the radio. It was like M88 or whatever it's yeah, called yeah. before that. Maybe static radio or something. 88.3. Yeah. And, uh, he was, he was teaching a sermon. It was a Sunday morning. He was teaching a sermon on, on repentance. I was like, oh my gosh. I turned the radio off. Continue the rest of the way quiet. I was running the soundboard that morning. And um, as I was mixing the sound, worship that pl- main worship, worship bands. Yep, they're 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 playing. They start the first song that I they they're 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 singing is about repentance. I was like, oh my gosh. I don't want to repent. I'm pissed. I have every right to be. And so I kind of tune that song out and I open up the Calvary Connection magazine and I'm turning the pages and it's a word from Chuck Smith about repentance. And I lost it. Sort of bawled my eyes out and I stood up and I was like, I got to let you go. I have to go home. And I drove, you, drove you, to, you, you, you left your post at the soundboard. Yep. I told Mike, the sound guy, I'm like, you're going to have to finish up for me, dude. I, I have to leave right now. I have to. And I drove, I drove to the compound and I went, I walked up the steps to my aunt's house, my aunt, uncle, one, one or two kids. And my, you drove from Calvary, Albuquerque? No, Calvary, Redoso. Oh, Redoso. Okay. Drove up, drove there and I repented. Like, I am so sorry for like, how disrespectful and rude and how much anger I've had towards you. And my aunt goes, okay. And I said, I also forgive you for like what you've done to me. She goes, okay, anything else? I was like, no, I think we're good. Like, okay. And I turned around and I left a different person. 
wasn't a hundred percent. I thought it was. I was like, I did it. Like it happened. I felt, I felt a massive weight because I had so much anger in my, in my soul. That I felt yep. towards him and, uh, it got better. <laughs> I thought I was healed. It, like, yeah, sure. Done. It wasn't like an it overnight thing, yeah, but was, you know, it wasn't magic. Let's say that being able to let go of your bitterness yeah. and, and being able to talk to the person who, um, caused it yeah. to you and, and did influence your life. Yeah. And, uh, are you able to look back on it and, and, uh, be grateful for anything? Yeah. Him? I learned lots of good skills. I mean, I think the longest time I, I just hated the whole thing, but really, I mean, I learned perseverance and, uh, in a, in a world like we live in today, uh, the gaslighting still makes me furious, but it, it's more hum humorous now. Um, it causes me to be very skeptical of, of anything I hear or, or see, cause I'm like, everyone's trying to spin a narrative. So I, I'm less likely to just less prone to be just believing things that take place. Um, helps me stand up for what I believe in. Cause through that whole season, like I imagine it really, really sh um, shook your trust in authority uh, in general, just like trust toward institutions, uh, things like that. I sense that and I have that too, you know, it, that did along with, uh, future things you know church you know churches sure are filled people yeah and so like those kind of things that would would happen and um it did for sure but i also am more prone to having grace with people because we're all susceptible to to making stupid decisions and it's like i don't see a person as what i think they may why they may be doing something i don't know why they're doing it i'm more prone to seeing their actions what what do i see them doing Cause I was told, I was always told growing up, like, well, that's not what, what's really happening. What's really happening is I'm like, I saw it. So I'm more prone to, to, I don't know. Like this is confusing. Like when I see somebody do something good, I'm more likely to believe they're doing it because they, they want to, they want to do a good thing. Mm. I don't know. For the most part. I guess I shouldn't be a, I shouldn't believe anything spiritual. It definitely, it caused me to be less, uh, less prayerful because I'm like, we had to pray for everything for hours on end, pray against the demons, pray against the spirits, pray for this to happen, pray that we would, whatever we win the lottery was a big one. They play the lottery every week because, because God was in a, was going to make them rich. Go to the gas station, buy some cigarettes and a lottery. They ticket. would buy lottery tickets like yeah. nobody's business. no, Cigarettes were made by my my um, cousins. Oh, my cousins would hand roll her cigarettes. Wait, did you guys grow your own tobacco? No. Oh, no. Okay. They bought natural American spirit in like go. giant bags. Yeah. Yep. And tubes. Yep. Um, but they, they always like this whole like believe there's a plan. Like there's a plan. Believe in the plan. I'm like don't believe. Trust it. the plan is not, literally Q. I don't trust the plan. <laughs> so I'm really not not prone to believing those things. Yeah. Because they it's all they're all theories. Yeah. It's a, it's a land of make-believe. So a lot of people probably hear your story and be like, but you're still Christian? Like, yeah. how did you... So let me ask you that. Uh, how did you... How, how would you say... Because, you know, I've, I've known you for a period of time. You know, you also went through the Mars Hill situation, and as, as did we all. And it was a big discouraging moment of, a, you know, a dismantling of, of our local... One of our local churches here, a prominent one. And I know it probably affected you to some degree. Uh, in fact, when I first came back, I remember we got dinner. Um, but yeah, so how did you, how did you kind of maintain or, you know, how do you still have faith despite all of the uh, falseness within the faith that you've experienced? If you know the story of Mars, I would say I was really angry with the leaders who wouldn't stand up for what was right. They let things keep happening, even though we all knew it was... Uh, an overbearing authoritarian who's pulling all the strings. They let him keep doing it. And so I, I printed out my, I, I actually made membership cards and handed them into one of the pastors. because I wanted to physically have like something to say, I am no longer a member here. Um, step down from, from leadership because I didn't want to lead someone into the presence of, of what I believe was happening based on actions. Um, and then ended up for a, for a, 
for a job transfer, moved to Phoenix. And it was a great, it was great timing to have distance when, cause Mars Hill completely imploded. And, uh, I would say I was not sustained. I was like, where, where'd God go? This sucks. I know, I know he's real, but he feels really distant. Like he doesn't, he doesn't hold tight to those who love him. And I don't know if I was angry. I was more, So we went to this the, a ti- the tiniest church in the world in, in Phoenix. It was a church plant. This is a, after Mars Hill. This is after Mars Hill. We moved to Phoenix. And I remember my wife asking. Funny enough, that's where he went. <laughs> he went there. Honestly, it was like within the same week that I moved to Phoenix. He announced that he was going to Phoenix. And I got text messages of, oh, are you going? I'm like, oh, <laughs> far from it, bro. Um, Wait, what? You got text messages from who? Friend, just people. Oh, okay, people just, from yeah, here. Yeah, Are people. you going to his church? Yeah. Okay. Um, we attended this this tiny church. I mean, it was a church of maybe 20-something people. All I wanted was not an establishment. You wanted I wanted purity. a small group of people who were just making it happen because out of just sheer willpower because mm-hmm. it was like they just love Jesus. Season of discouragement. You uh, wanted just refreshment, yes. purity. Yep. Not a system, but like life. And uh, so we found this tiny little church and the worship pastor. I mean, I swear, like it was almost like he ran the slides and the drums and play guitar. And he, he, it was like a one man show, but he just loved, he just loved Jesus. It was, it was evident with every bone in his body. And uh, I trusted him. Why? I don't know. I could just tell like this dude loves Jesus. And Tish asks him like, Hey, my my husband is discouraged. He doesn't want to pray. He believes in God, but he just isn't the same person he was. How can I like, what do we do to like fix this? And he said, leave him alone. Mm. It's not, it's not a matter of fix. You don't fix him. God's relational God, something to this effect of the God's relational God and, and that relationship will be mended. So just let him be. And in hearing that, mm. first that response is not usual. You know, it's a system, X, Y, and Z, read this book. And it, he, he proved himself to me in that response. And even just hearing that was, was healing to know like, you're not trying to fix me. You're willing to actually let God work. Like we say, we believe he was willing to do that. And so we walk away and Tish is like, man, okay, that makes sense. I'll, I'll just let you be. I'll be praying for you. Like, I appreciate it. And that was like the beginning turning point of me, me knowing that there are still people in systems, in mm. churches Give you that hope. love Jesus, yeah. that aren't built around Let's make more numbers. We just love him. Mm -hmm. We are not here to fix people. We believe that God does. And he showed all that in like very few words. And he shared with like, like he deals with depression. He does construction. Like that's his real job was he was a contractor. And in summer for that, for him, it's the most depressing time. It's 118 degrees and he does manual labor in the sun. And so for him, that's a hard season to push through. He's like, so I've been in seasons that feel dry. Like you're in the wilderness for me, it's summer. And I was like, it was just, it was like that, that, that instance of what took place there was like ministered to my heart. Like God's real. And he just spoke to me. This is how he speaks to me Mm -hmm. through others. And, uh, Hmm. why did I maintain faith when I was an Arminian? (laughs) I would say I'm strong enough. God built a strong-willed kid. Which doesn't make a whole lot of sense because a, a lot of my cousins didn't fare so well coming out of this. But then I, and, and to be able to maintain, like my, my aunt would bring up scriptures of, she would reinterpret the Bible and I would go back to the strongest concordance. And, I, and she would say, this word means like familiar spirit, for example. So you had to be a Berean. Like, so familiar spirit is me like, do you mind if I share? I wouldn't say it. this is all in anger. Actually, this is what this is what familiar spirits are. In in, in um, when Solomon mentions familiar spirit, now I go to you know Psalm you know 
Strong's Concordance number fifty one forty two. Pull it up. This is the in Greek. This is in Hebrew. This and I would and I would prove to her that she was she was a, a heretic, and then so then she was screaming at me. I'm like, well, <laughs> it doesn't matter to me if you scream at me. Like this is the word. Like in the original text, you are wrong. And so then she was screaming at me and telling me like, I've been a Christian longer than you've been alive. I'm like, okay, so because you're older, that makes you right. That doesn't That's fly. So it was always like this authority. Like yeah. I'm the one who tells you. And so she wouldn't subject herself. I thought to of the all those things. Yeah, no, 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 she was the authority. Yeah. And so I thought of all these things as like I was wired in a way that I could persevere through what took place because me, I did this. And so then I, I kind of had more of an ego trip of like, I, I, I had righteous anger for a minute, unrighteous anger for a lifetime is like kind of how I operated. And then I started listening to Piper and Driscoll and uh, Chandler, MacArthur. The reformed. The reformed dudes. Modern, you know, American. And all they did was tell me how sucky I was. Mm-hmm. And I, without him, I'd be nothing. And I'd listen to it. And I would, I would bawl my eyes out. Just, to, um, um, realizing that it wasn't me that saved myself from a cult or from anything, but it was him for me. Yes, at times through me, but God was the one who chooses whom He chooses. And he saves whom he saves. And he saved me from this. And so it caused me to place my faith instead of I'm so strong, I can do, to you're so good because of you, I will just continue to live my life for you. So it, it was, I've always had faith in God, but it looked very different as time went on. And so the credit came, um, the understanding, the moment of like revelation of understanding for you was so powerful that it wasn't of any of your doing, but simply by him. And so you weren't able to take credit for, it's not a thing that we do that we can boast. Right. If we were to boast in anything is him is kind of what you're t- talking about is there's revelation yes. occurred to you and you were like, whoa, have my life. It was just, it was like when Paul says, the only thing I know is Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's it. It's just yeah. him at the end of the day. <laughs> I remember having a conversation with you, you know, it was probably 2016, 17, and you were in a discouraged moment and you had us over for dinner, me and my wife. And uh, I, could, I could tell that you were in a, in a moment, you know, you were having difficulty. And I remember you told me something that was like kind of profound. I don't know. But you felt as if the tenderness of the Lord at the moment wasn't there. Uh, and you said, I just, as a father, if my child was feeling the way that I feel, I would, I just want to hug them. I just want to, you know, embrace them. And, and you didn't feel that way at the time. Would you there say have been that, times, for sure. Would you say that, um, I imagine, I've observed in you that that's, you know, you have, uh, you know, you've, kind of changed and altered that perspective. And maybe the revelation of this is, is a part of that, like, oh, wow, I get it. Thank you, Lord. You called me. You drew me. You're drawing me. You, you picked me out of all of these things, out of all of my circumstances, all of all my background, all of my sin, and yet you still persevered. You still called me. You still drew me unto yourself, and you've not given up on me. Would you say that's maybe part of that? I would say it's a struggle to to maintain that mm-hmm. posture. Um, God doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Like if I the, the <laughs> if I were God, I wouldn't do this way. If I were God, man, this would be a a nightmare. Justice, fire and brimstone from heaven, right? So <laughs> yeah. like anytime we start to think that way, it, it's it's some. I found it hard in some seasons to be like, why wouldn't you just come and save us and make this easier? Yeah. But in hindsight, it's like, well, thank you. Yep. Character. Yeah. That's not how you refine Suffering. gold. Exactly. That's not how you sharpen a knife. Yeah. It's through, it's through the struggle. Mm-hmm. When you hear people like Joe Rogan ask the questions of like the problem of evil or, 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 or then why would he allow sin? 
<laughs> nothing works without the opposite. In all of life, there's always an opposite. It must be. And it, and you also don't even know what, what good is if you didn't have bad. It also makes the good even better. It even makes things that suck that aren't terrible, not suck so bad. Like it just, it, it brings perspective. On a lighter note, I, I, we came back from a camping trip last night. I was filthy. Our whole family was just filthy. <laughs> we were out for five nights in the middle of, you know, Colorado, sleeping in a tent. And we were just real, real, real stinky, dirty, gross. And I was kind of thinking about it in the same way. It's like, this is probably the most clean I've ever felt <laughs> because of how dirty I was. But it's kind of like that, yeah. you know? And I wouldn't have that contrast had I not gotten that dirty. And it's kind of, I was thinking about it when I was bathing myself. I was thinking, I don't get that dirty often enough. And kind of like regretting it. Or excited to take showers in general. It's like, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh. It's, yeah. Um, but the contrast matters. Yep. Because it teaches us. Suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character. And character produces hope. hope. Yep. Awesome. I think that's a good place to end. Sure. Sounds good to me. Thank you, uh, Matt, for coming on, telling the, the cold story. I'm sure we'll have you on again and we'll just kind of shoot this stuff cool. <laughs> and uh, have fun. But uh, yeah, that's about it. Love you guys. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>